This is Join Us in France, episode 11. Hello, I'm Annie. And I'm Elise. And this is a travel podcast about France. And on today's show, we are going to talk all about champagne. Which should make you very happy, Annie, right? <laughs> yes, it will. <laughs> okay, I have my first question for you. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and see how good your answers are. Uh -oh. uh, my first question is, why do you think that champagne is such a popular drink? Because it tastes good? Uh, because it tastes good, <laughs> yeah. Because it's fun for parties? Because it's fun for parties. Um, because it keeps well, maybe? It keeps fairly well, actually. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, um, because it can be sold at a good price. Oh well, that certainly makes this country, France, very, very <laughs> happy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I I guess it's for all of those reasons. You know, it's it's considered to be uh, really the drink for celebration, mm -hmm. right? It really it's, is. It's the drink for celebration. And what I thought would be fun to do as we talk about the, uh, the, the beverage itself and the history of it is talk a little bit about how it came to be the drink of celebration. Cause that's sounds, kind of fun to do. Sounds wonderful. Second question, Annie. Okay. Where is champagne country? Oh, that I know it's, uh, okay. It's, East of Paris, maybe a tad south? No, a tad north. It's, oh. actually, it's actually not even a tad north. Basically, it's a region. The Champagne, yep. as, as of course with all the wines in France, which is very different from other parts of the world, but all the wines in France are designated by the region that they are from. Right. And Champagne is actually a big region, mm -hmm. and it is northeast of France. Paris, yep. and it's pretty much about 45 degrees, you could just say it's about 45 degrees northeast, because it's a big region, and it actually goes into another part called the Ardennes, uh, which touches Belgium, so it really goes up that, that far, yep. and it is basically the center of the Champagne region is just about 130 kilometers as the crow flies from Paris, which okay. is what, about 80, 85 miles. I would say that's right. Yeah, yeah, 80, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So it is, in fact, the n most northern region that produces wine in France. Oh, okay. And it's been famous because uh, it is so far north, and for a long time, people were astonished that there would actually be good wine produced there because they get pretty cold, wet winters. Yes, they do. Uh, okay, I have a third question for you. Oh, okay. This one... I'll have to buy you something if you can answer it. So this is really that kind of a question. It's a, it's a right. trap question. Try okay? me, try me. This is a very special year, the year 2014, in relation to the history of the drink champagne. Yeah. Do you have any idea why? Uh, none whatsoever. Let's see. Um, let me take a guess. It's uh, the... A thousand years production of champagne? I don't well, know. You're pretty... Good. That's pretty oh, close. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Ooh, you have to buy me something oh, I have to now. Buy you something. <laughs> I maybe have to buy you a bottle of champagne. <laughs> nice. It is actually exactly this year is the 900th anniversary oh. of the charter that was made by the Archbishop of the Champagne region. It was a very rich and very powerful area in the Middle Ages. Oh. And they created what they call a charter, which is something that's uh, everywhere in France in terms of the history, that designated officially the wines of the Champagne region as a special kind of wine. Yep. And so we are actually celebrating this year the 900th 900. anniversary. However, <laughs> it was not the Champagne that we know today it was actually ah. a kind of wine as oh. opposed to a bubbly wine. No bubbles. No bubbles. No, no oh. bubbles. Well, the bubbles came later and that's part of the wonderful <laughs> history. And I know that's what you love best about the champagne is the bubbles anyway. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, no, the bubbles actually came later and they're part of the, uh, the, the, the wonderful uh, history of how champagne actually came to be. Mm -hmm. But in fact, uh, grapes were grown for wine in this region starting in approximately the uh, 4th century AD. Okay. That's a long time ago. It's a long time ago. It was still Gaul, mm -hmm. basically. It was before even the end of the uh, fall of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And it was the Romans who brought the grapevines to this region like they did almost everywhere else. And uh, because they were such fanatics about having to have their wine wherever they went... I agree. They planted these... <laughs> 
grapevines, and what happened was the, 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 the grapevines actually adapted to each special region, mm. and so they developed into uh, grapes that had sp- specific tastes, depending oh, yeah. upon the region. Yeah. But um, the, the varieties that are used today for making champagne, to be honest, I don't think they existed that long ago. I okay. mean, these, these are varieties of grapes that have been uh, developed over the yes. last several things hundred change. years. Yeah. Things, yeah. things do change. But in fact, uh, there is documentation that there was wine production in the Champagne area going back as far as the 4th century. That's amazing. And of course... But this, I mean, I'm sure if... It, of course they made wine because it's... It's nice. Wine yeah, is well, great. Well, that, that's a very nice French comment. It's, of course they made wine because it's nice. You know. Well, let's put it this way. The Romans made wine because it was their daily beverage. And the way the Romans drank wine was diluted. It was very mm. different. It was a, in other words, the, the Romans knew that there were properties in water that were sometimes unhealthy. This is mm-hmm. very interesting. And so, in fact... The daily beverage all day long was a a, a brew that, that was a mix of water and red wine. Oh wow! With spices. Oh, and the uh, I'm not the, so sure about that. But. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's the the fact that there were spices and there was the red wine actually helped make the water safe to drink. I see. So they didn't drink it the way we do as a potent beverage. Uh, it really was what they drank, the way we drink water all day long. Oh, wow. And That's uh, it probably was, not a good idea, but Well, it, 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 <laughs> you know, if you dilute it enough, I mean, you, you know, it's kind of a shame to waste the wine. That's the way we would feel about it today. Yeah. But for them, it was simply what they drank. Yeah, but if you have a buzz on all day, you're not going to get a lot of things done. I don't think they got a buzz from it, though. Oh, I really maybe don't. not. Maybe not. No, they did make a on nectar. On hot days, they would have, though. If you have to drink two or three liters of that whatever beverage, you'll be pretty maybe even maybe. diluted. I mean, well, you know, because like a weak beer, if you if that's all, you know like a even a three percent alcohol beer, if that's all you drink all day long, that's true. That is really bad well, for you. It helped them go fight. They won. They I, they I managed guess. to take the whole <laughs> whole of Europe that way. You know. Okay. So first we have the Romans, and then uh, the impetus. And this is not just for Champagne country, but pretty much everywhere. But it's really fascinating in relation to Champagne. The impetus later on, a few centuries later, for the further development of wine was the monasteries. Mm. Because, of course, wine is used in service for the Eucharist in the church. You yeah. know, you have the, the, the chalice with the wine in it. And monasteries all through the early Middle Ages developed everywhere. And particularly, the earliest ones were what we call Benedictine monasteries. Yeah. And the Benedictine monasteries flourished, flourished absolutely everywhere. And the monks, they part of what they have to do is they have to work, which means they had to f- work the fields, they had to grow things. Uh-huh. And they developed an economy of grapevines and they turned that into wine that they actually sold. Huh. And the monasteries actually survived a lot for centuries by selling the wine that they produced. That's great. And each region, of course, wound up producing somewhat different kinds of wines. Mm-hmm. But that's how come we have a bunch of liqueurs. That is, you know, we have uh, Chartreuse, we have Cointreau, we have all these things. Yes. And there were several very important Benedictine monasteries in this region and they really liked producing this wine Hmm. now what happened was that for centuries wine was simply shipped out in barrels in barrels in barrels wow right well think about this you want a little wine with dinner no you (laughs) have a barrel you have to have a barrel (laughs) there were no bottles there were no bottles because glass was a commodity that was extraordinarily expensive, very hard uh, to find. Yeah. And glass bottles, as we know them, basically did not exist. Ah. So uh, the kings ordered wine in barrels, and uh, you know the Romans used to ship wine in huge ceramic jars that were sealed with wax, that were mm. sealed with beeswax. And then they would pour them into smaller pitchers, and that's how they used the, the oh. wine. So for, for centuries and centuries, wine was simply put into these barrels. And uh, what happened was uh, that uh, one day, 
and this is of course quite a number of centuries later, mm -hmm. some of the monks in one of these Benedictine monasteries in the Champagne area realized that the wine in these barrels was fermenting. Ah, but they didn't want it to ferment because they really didn't want it to have this effervescence and it was considered ah. to make it spoiled wine. Oh. So at first, the fact that there was this slight bubbly quality to the wine was... They didn't uh, want. We didn't want this. I mean, it was like... Well, let's... honestly, if you opened a bottle of white wine today right. and it had bubbles in it, you, you'd be like, oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. It's Unless not. you expect it to have bubbles. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Uh, it, it's interesting because, and the other thing is, is that at that time, wine was a little sweeter. Even, it's not cooked wine, but wine, basically, the taste that people had for wine was a little bit sweeter than it is today. Mm -hmm. Today, we really mostly like to drink dry wines. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was... The, the monks in the monasteries really had a problem and they mm. didn't know what to do uh, to keep this wine from turning. And part of that was because it was not properly sealed. And the mm. other thing was that they were using varieties of grapes that tended to ferment very quickly. Ah, So, uh, you know, there was no such thing as the profession of being an analog at the time. Mm -hmm. But in every monastery, there were a couple of people who just had the right knows for things like this, uh -huh. right? And slowly they started to realize that maybe they had to control what was happening in the barrels mm. to make wine be either a real wine or to control this effervescence and see if they could convince people that it was okay to drink <laughs> wine that had some bubbles in it, you know? Imagine I mean, that. Imagine that, right? You know? So, I mean, we're, we're talking of a long period of time when wine was really the exclusive production of monasteries. So uh -huh. we're going from the 4th century up through into, really, the 12th century, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is a long time. Yeah. And who drank a lot of wine? Well, the royal families, yeah. the aristocrats, the kings of France, the kings of England, the kings of Spain, and the entourage, and the counts of all these various regions, and the mm -hmm. people, the basic, ordinary person who was not very wealthy did not drink wine. Ah. They drank a beverage that would probably be the equivalent of a kind of local beer ah, okay. or cider. Uh huh. Because they did make a lot of things like cider. They would use fruit and they ferment the fruit. Yeah. But wine was really the exclusive property of people who had a certain amount of money and privilege. Mm, okay. And so it's very different from today, even though, of course, we know that champagne has a certain cachet attached yeah, to it. Yeah, champagne right? still. I mean, it can be pretty expensive. It can be pretty expensive. Yeah. So here's another question for you. Okay. Knowing the history of France. Uh-oh, here we go back to her <laughs> high school years. Oh, dear. And thinking about who in the past have been the arch enemies of France. The English? Yeah, the yeah. English. Well, believe it or not, it is actually thanks to the English that we have champagne. <laughs> so well, there they have you to go. Be good for something, don't something they? Something <laughs> good, yeah. I was like, I was just gonna kidding. Say, that was humor. <laughs> anybody who's French out there listening to this, yeah, you're going to have to accept this. This is just the way it is, right? Because believe it or not, this is what happened. Starting really, and this is amazing, but it is, of course, part of the whole history. Uh, starting in the 1200s, the English court started importing French wines. Mm. And they imported what, of course, the French like to still call claret, which was this very dark, oh, yeah, rich, claret, red, so yeah. red wine. A lot of it coming from the south, coming from the region of Cahors, which you and I know, yeah. and Bordeaux. But they also were importing wines coming from the Champagne area. Mm. And when they had these barrels arrive on the ships and the wines had turned they started getting very upset about it because yes. this was not uh, a cheap yes. uh, product. You mm -hmm. know, this was something they were importing for the court and for all the dukes yeah. and princes and everything else. N yeah, nothing good is going to come of that. Nothing good. I no. mean, they didn't quite go to war over it, but, you know, <laughs> almost. And then, and I don't know the name of the person, but actually it was an Englishman who realized that perhaps one of the secrets to keeping the wine from turning was to put it into glass oh. and to seal up the bottles. 
and so the actual concept of a wine bottle was developed in england oh in the early 1600s oh wow i did not know that at all well actually it's really fabulous to know that there was this kind of exchange in spite of all the other problems that they were having yeah glass was starting to be less expensive mm -hmm. and the first actual production of wine bottles made of glass was in england mm. and they sold this idea to the french mm. and what happened was it was taken to the champagne region and the monasteries decided to invest in using these glass bottles and putting the wine after the first fermentation that of course happens to make it into alcohol and to yes. make it into wine, put it into the glass bottles and they would seal it up, not with cork at first because they didn't realize that they could use cork, natural cork. Mm -hmm. They were sealing it up with pieces of wood ah. and they were mm. covering the wood with a cloth. They ah. would make these little plugs made out of wood and try and plug it up. But what happened was... That's not real that the combination of grapes and this is what's so incredible is that this was really a natural process the combination mm -hmm. of grapes that they were using because it is a mix of different varieties of grapes yep. was still fermenting inside the bottles ah. well now of course this is what we know as how you make champagne champagne uh -huh. is a wine that has two fermentations one in the barrels before it's put in the bottle yeah and one inside the bottle itself uh -huh. except that this time this was still a problem because nobody wanted to drink this wine this way and so little by little the monks in the monastery started experimenting and they discovered that if they made a bottle that was thick mm. that would withstand the pressure yeah because it's got to be a lot of pressure well guess what Guess how much pressure? Because this is one of those facts. When I start preparing for one of these, I start looking this. I don't know. I don't up. know. Like, let's say uh, uh, my car tires are like 30 PSI. Well, I don't know what a PSI is, but uh, I'll tell you. Pounds that the, per square inch. The pressure inside a bottle of champagne is the equivalent of six atmospheres. Six atmospheres. I have no idea how that compares to well, pounds per square inch. I think that, that that's the equivalent but, but that's, of uh, six times gravity. <laughs> I mean, in the sense that atmosphere, it's, yeah, it's where we really, stand here, yeah. it's enormous. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. absolutely enormous. Yeah. So what happened was, some very brilliant monks realized that what they had to do was make really thick bottles, mm -hmm. and then they started playing around with the taste of the wine inside the bottles. Mm. And the other thing that was introduced by the English was the use of cork. Instead of wood. Instead of wood. Which would be immensely better. And of course, the reason why is because cork is in fact porous. So mm -hmm. it absorbs some of the pressure because the wood was actually exploding out of these yeah. first bottles. And it was, I can imagine, I'm sure some people lost their <laughs> eyes on top of everything else. They lost whatever they was lost. in the way. <laughs> and so what happened was they started developing this and then they realized that they had to seal the uh, cork. Uh -huh. And the first thing they did was use beeswax. Uh huh, and of course now we use the wire on top yes. of the cork. But they yes. were doing what they were doing was they were manufacturing these very thick bottles, and they were pouring the wine in, and then putting in a piece of natural cork, and then sealing it with beeswax. Mm. And here we come to somebody whose name, if you've ever had any champagne, everybody knows the story of Dom Perignon. Yes, I knew you were going to go to that. Well, he really existed. Yes, he was a Benedictine monk. Yes. In the year 1670, he started working on experiments with this beverage. And he was the one who developed what we now call champagne. Ah. Up until that point, the wine was a bit sweeter. Mm -hmm. And the problem with fermentation and the creation of the bubbles was really a problem. It wasn't an advantage for this wine. Mm. He actually did some traveling and believe it or not, what he did was he went south in France to another Benedictine monastery in a place called Saint-Hilaire, which is in Limoux, a place that you and I both know. Yes. Not too far. And from. they make bubbly there. Very good and bubbly. And guess what? Yeah. They had been making an effervescent wine for several centuries. Ah, there you go. And so the technique of champagne with the bubbles is actually a technique that he took back 
from the Benedictine Abbey in Saint Hilaire in the south of France. Oh. And he took it to Champagne. And he said... He probably adjusted it and modified well, it. Well, what for he did was, he was really brilliant, and he was a born onologue because mm. he loved this, and it was a, a very scientific... He had studied as a Jesuit, so he had a very scientific spirit, mm -hmm. even though he was a Benedictine monk. Mm -hmm. And he started mixing the three different kinds of grapes that they grew in the area, and mixing them, knowing that every year the crop was a little bit different. And he started yes. putting the three together. Yes. And he had followed, he'd written down, taken notes about the, the bubbly process. Mm -hmm. And his idea was, if he could mix this, make a wine that tasted really very, very good, and then put it in these bottles, he would make this wine that would have this wonderful effervescence and that the effervescence would actually help change the taste of the wine. So the three varieties of grapes are Pinot Noir, yes, which is also a grape that's used in Burgundy, Burgundy wines. Of course, yes. Chardonnay, which okay. most people think is the only grape used in Champagne, but that's absolutely not true. Okay. And the third grape that most people outside of the Champagne area have never heard of called Pinot Meunier. Pinot Meunier. Meunier. Okay. And the three kinds of grapes are always mixed together in somewhat different proportions right. according to the taste year by year. Yes. And the three put together do, in fact, make what we now call champagne. Uh -huh. You can buy a bottle of wine that is made in Champagne country that is only 100% Chardonnay, but believe it or not, it's not called champagne. It's called Blanc des Blancs. Ah. And the reason why is because Pinot Noir is actually a red grape with white flesh on the inside. Uh -huh. And what they do when they make the wine is they press the grape so quickly that none of the red comes off the skin. The colors. The, yeah. That colors They remove it. that. They remove it immediately. It's an mm -hmm. incredible amount of pressure used in a first pressing. Mm -hmm. And they mix that with the juice of the Chardonnay. And then they mix it according to the year with a certain percentage of the Pinot Meunier. Each one of these grows in certain parts of the Champagne area. And they mix them all together. And what he discovered, Dom Perignon, was that by changing the proportion every year, by tasting them, mm -hmm. and he wrote a treatise on the making of this wine, and he said, you have to do this by tasting it in the morning before you taste anything else. So <laughs> I can imagine what he was like by the end of the day. <laughs> he would get up every morning and he would do this tasting. And of course, now nice. he spit it out, but I doubt if he spit it out Did at the time. Did he live long? He lived a long time. He oh, there you go. So he lived to be about 70 years old. He must have been reasonable. <laughs> he was brilliant, in fact. And it was thanks to him that they started making this wine that immediately was taken up by the court in Paris. And when the court in England found out about it, since they were the ones who were importing so much wine already from this region, and they were the ones who, would, of course, had introduced the idea of the very thick bottle and everything else, yeah. they started importing it as well. And champagne, starting in the late 1600s mm -hmm. became the drink of all of the aristocracy of Western Europe. Aha. Uh -huh. And it became... Oh, it still is, really. It still is, but yeah. now, of course, you know, we can, we can buy bottles ourselves too. Right. Uh, but it's really fascinating to know that the refinement, of, this is what they call it, the actual refinement of the making of champagne was thanks to Dom Perignon. Mm -hmm. Now, there are three, three things, if you ever go, and we'll talk about this another time when we talk about visiting Champagne country. Yeah. When you go and visit some of the cave, it's, of course, fascinating. The thing about champagne is that it does indeed have two fermentations. So first you have this liquid, which is basically pretty clear, and it is fermented once and made into this wine, mm -hmm. and it is put into the bottles, and then the bottles are kept for a minimum of two years, mm. and the bottles are turned. You know, this is called the turning, mm -hmm. and they're turned a quarter turn every single day oh, wow. for two years. And this is a bottle of champagne. There are other kinds of effervescent wines. Right. But this is what is champagne. It's yeah. a mix of wines. It doesn't have a date on it because what they call in French a millisime. Yes. Which means it has a vintage year. Yes. It does not exist in champagne country. 
It exists for approximately 5% of the wines. They are extraordinarily expensive. They are ah, usually about yeah. $250 a bottle. Right, because I have heard of uh, champagnes that are millésimé. Yes. So there are some. There are but... some, but it's not considered to be the best champagne. Really? Because, they are, because to get the best champagne... You have to play it by nose and mouth mm. every single year. And, of course, that's a pun. But the fact is that the whole concept of champagne is that you change the proportion every single year and you sometimes take wine from last year or two years ago to mix in with a newly pressed wine mm. because what counts is not only the taste but the production of the tiny millions and millions of little bubbles in the wine. Mm. See, what's interesting to me is that I've always heard that when you buy champagne, you, you kind of find a brand that you like and you, you like that flavor and that year after year you will find that f same flavor. Well, that's the ideal. Yeah. The ideal is that they mix and match as much as possible to keep the taste the same. Yeah. So a few things to know because I want to talk about some of the statistics because they're <laughs> absolutely mind-blowing. Yeah. But the taste in wine, in champagne, has changed. And it was the English, of course, who were the pace setters about all of this. Yeah. So until the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, champagne was basically sweet. I it would have was, liked that better because I, to this day, I prefer a kind of uh, demi-sec champagne. I like it dry. Yeah. I really yeah. like it dry. And of course, that is a 20th century thing. The idea at the time of Victoria. You're so modern. I'm very modern. <laughs> and you're so not modern. You know. uh, Victoria and, and everybody in England and everybody in France right through into the 20th century. The champagne was, of course, what we would now call the, the demi-brut, which is, of course, a little bit sweeter. And, of course, the new tendency... It's not demi-brut, it's demi-sec. Demi-sec. I always get them confused. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> I, why, why don't they just say dry and, and semi-dry? It would make it so much easier. I know. Um, the, 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 the new tendency, uh, as of the last uh, 15, 20 years, mm -hmm. is rosé champagne. Yes. And there's more and more of it being produced. Yes. But in fact, of course, basically what we know of champagne is this wonderful, very, very clear beverage. Uh -huh. Well, th I'll tell you the truth. When I have to spend, you know, if I buy champagne, it's usually uh, because there's a special event. Say I've invited family over, there's like uh, 16 of us or whatever, I'm going to need four bottles of champagne. Because the thing is, you start the meal with champagne, typically in France, you know, and you end the meal with champagne, one or the other, or both. So you're going to need quite a bit of champagne. And each bottle runs you, what, 30 euros? Well, you can, you know... There's some differences. There's but... some differences. Let me, let me give you some statistics, because this is really fascinating. And having spent some time... Uh, in the last year in Champagne country uh, and having talked to one of the people in one of the uh, uh, caves about uh, the pricing of Champagne. Yeah, so, yeah. But just some statistics because I find this absolutely fascinating. And now we know that wine production is a major, major uh, billion dollar industry of course. in France. This is about Champagne and only about Champagne. The Champagne region includes approximately 33,000 hectares Okay. that produce wine grapes mm -hmm. for the production of champagne. 33,000 hectare, you have to multiply that about 2.2 to get acres, okay? okay? Okay, okay. There are approximately 260 domains, which means people who produce the wine. And there's, these are small exploitations because what they do is one person will produce some Pinot Noir, another person produces some Chardonnay. Yes. But there are lots of what we call small champagne houses. And we'll talk about that more when we talk about actually going and visiting Champagne yes. Country. Yes, yes. There are five of the most famous that are now on the stock exchange. Oh, wow. So you can actually buy actions. You can buy stock in Champagne Is if you want. And do you know which they are? Uh, I know that two of them are uh, the Moet Chandon because they were bought up by um, uh, the um, Vuitton. Uh, they were bought okay. up by, by uh, Pinot and Vuitton. Okay. The, the, basically, the ones that are on the stock market are ones that were bought up and are now part of a major conglomeration. Uh -huh. So w we can talk a little bit more about that because when the next time we'll talk about visiting the houses and what it's like to visit the houses, yes, yes. there are some uh, major places that you can go. In number of bottles, in uh, 
2012, there were 2.1 million hectoliters. Mm-hmm. 268 million bottles of champagne were produced wow. in the year 2012. 268 million? Million. Million. And just in case you're thinking, oh, it would be nice to go at, after I retire and live in Champagne country and maybe produce some grapes, you should know that in the year 2010, <laughs> one hectare of officially designated Champagne land was sold for 1.5 million euros. Oh, good grief. Get over uh, yourself, champagne okay. people. Okay. <laughs> it is gold. It yeah, is yeah, liquid yeah. gold. Yeah. Now, a little bit more of information. Yeah. The best way to buy champagne, this will be interesting to you because for our next party, this is what we should do. <laughs> Believe it or not, and especially if you're going to keep it and not drink it immediately. Oh, that's a lot to ask. Is buy it <laughs> in a magnum bottle. It turns out oh. that scientifically, for some reason, the Magna bottle, which is a 1.5 liters, yes. is so the twice best as big way as a... to keep champagne. It ages better. It allows a little bit of space for the bubbles, and it actually improves the taste. Huh. Most of the time, we buy it in a regular standard three-quarters of a liter bottle. The yeah. worst way to buy champagne is in a half liter bottle the smaller the bottle oh, yeah the worse it is in terms of the taste just in case i just so oh, yeah i don't buy sm- okay. tiny bottles of for champagne. our next also- party annie let's go buy a, bu- a bottle in a, a magnum <laughs> now just before because i know we have to finish today yeah. but just to give you the names of some of them because there are many many houses and there are many what they call small houses and just a tip for those of you after listening to this who want to go out and run to your wonderful wine store and buy some champagne. You get a better deal if you buy a lesser known brand and it will also be excellent champagne because yeah. obviously there's a lot of marketing that goes into some of the bigger known companies. So some of the best known, of course, are uh, Verve Cricot, yes. Tattinger, Moet and Chandon. Yeah. Uh, you have a Heidesec, Lafitte, Pomeray, you have uh, an old one. It's one of the oldest. It's called Rui Mar, and mm. it is actually considered to be the oldest official hmm. champagne house in the region. And then you have Mum. Uh, you yes. have Martel, which is a very good champagne that is uh, sold in France, but is not exported, believe it or not. It's mm-hmm. actually sold only in France. And those are only some of the best known of the companies. Mm-hmm. You have... Over 200 brands of champagne. Yes, there's many, yes. And it really is a celebratory kind of thing to drink. Right, and it's kind of funny. If you go to a discount store in France, one of those uh, Lidl or Lidl Price or whatever, they have usually one or two types of champagne in the store. And it starts at 7 euros or 8 euros. And it's probably not very good. I haven't bought them. I wouldn't buy a bottle of champagne for that. But but what I do know, because I've been to to Rance and apparently three or four times in the last two two years. Yeah. uh, What I do know is when you talk to, not the people who sell a particular brand like Moet and Chandon, which is of course part of the same big group as uh, Dom Perignon now. Uh But if you go to one of the stores that is a, a store that sells 50 different kinds of champagne. Yeah. They will tell you that if you walk in and uh, you buy a bottle for 20 euros, mm-hmm. which is what, $25, $30 at the most, mm-hmm. you can get something that is as good as a 50 euro bottle that is a bigger name because mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. small companies and of course it also as you said earlier it depends on the taste you want yes one of the things that's good about going to a cavist is that you tell them what kind of taste you like and they will give you a suggestion about which ones to buy is that a word in english caviste a a caviste yeah i believe that's a french word but i don't know if it's an english word well it's a wine let's explain it's a wine expert in other words instead of going to a place where they actually manufacture the wine uh you go to a store that has many different brands. Their specialty is to sell one particular thing. In this case, it's champagne. Mm -hmm. And they will list the characteristics of each bottle of champagne. Right. And they will have prices that go from relatively inexpensive to extremely expensive. That's one thing that's really good about 
being in France is that you can walk into a caviste or or even some of the better grocery stores and they have somebody who's knowledgeable on right. hand and who's really knowledgeable. And you can just say, I want to spend, you know, 20 u- euros and I want it not too dry or I want it really dry or I want it to go with, you know, right. this sort of apéro or whatever. And, and, and they'll and find they'll you help, something. And they'll find you. Yeah, and yeah. This is, I, you know, b- the last time... I came back with three bottles. I, if you remember, I actually brought one over once. We had. Yes. Uh, I'm not that big a connoisseur, so that it, I can tell when the differences are really noticeable between yeah. the different brands of champagne. Yeah. And of course, I do like it really dry, so yeah. I do know that. But I, I could have spent days inside this <laughs> store with the cavist. Do they? Do they? Make, do everything. they let you try? Because no. they let you no. try wine, but probably not champagne. Because no. they let you. Taste the uh, champagne if you go to one of the champagne houses. Okay. And when you do a visit, which we'll talk about when we talk about yes. actually spending a day there, yes. then they do allow you to taste some of the champagne. Yes. But the problem, of course, with the uh, bottles of champagne is once you uncorked it, it's very hard right. to, to get the cork back in. So oh, they you don't, cannot. They don't taste, uh, they yeah. don't give t- tastings to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But listen. Yeah. We have to go and yes, go we need get to some finish. champagne now. I mean, I just, <laughs> I'm going to go have some bubbly with my lunch today, I guess. <laughs> a bubbly lunch. A bubbly lunch. That's yeah. decadent. That's decadent. We never got back to the thing about the, the, the rosé champagne. Okay. I, I, and I started telling you that I, um, uh, I, I had one of those cavistes to try to sell me six bottles of rosé champagne uh-huh. for a special event and i just could not bring myself to to me if it's pink it's not as nice it's i don't know maybe nice. it's maybe it's um i i think it's there's fashion in things and just like there's fashion in champagne just like there's fashion yeah, in anything yeah. else i had a taste of a rosé champagne the last time i was in uh, Rants, and it actually was quite good it uh. was fairly dry uh-huh. it was a teeny bit sweeter than, of course, the super dry, uh, clear champagne. Uh, what they do is they allow the grape to just stay pressed Macerate a, little, a little, teeny little yeah, bit longer. Yeah, yeah. But they have to be very careful with uh, champagne that's a rosé because it should not pick up too much of the taste of the red wine. Right. And I don't think it's going to be something that will last for very long. Mm-mm. It is something that they export to Japan. Ah. And the United States. Okay. okay. The two places where there's a tendency to want something that's fashionable. New. And new. They want to try something but new, yeah. But personally, I would place bets on the fact that we go back to our good old, wonderful, clear, bubbly. <laughs> yeah, for every event. <laughs> for every event. Absolutely every event. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Well, I think we need to wrap up. I think we do. Thank you very much, Elise. Thank you, listeners. We would love to hear your feedback. We would love it if you would go to iTunes and write us a review. If you would send us an email, tell us if you like this episode, if that's the sort of thing you want to hear from us. Um, If you have suggestions, whatever. We're always happy to hear from you. And we'll be talking to you again soon. Very good. Talk to you next week. Bye, Annie. Au revoir.